Boys and girls, today I want to talk about this, about DI boxes, the instrument input on your interface. Because DI boxes matter. They're actually much more important than most people think. We're all recording DI signals these days, right? And those devices will color your sound. They will be a part of your guitar tone. And believe me, they all sound different. So in this video, I'm gonna try to explain what a DI box is, what it can do for you, and how you can find the right DI box for you. I'm even gonna show you how you can heavily color and even distort your guitar tone with the help of a DI box. I'm going to show you all those different models here. That's going to be a lot of fun. Time to learn something about DI boxes. Here we go. So before showing you all those different models, I want to start with a theoretical part where I try to explain what a DI box is. So I'm going to talk about impedance. I'm going to talk about balance signals and stuff like that. So if, you know, if that sounds interesting to you, you better stay tuned. If that sounds boring or if you have some kind of TikTok attention span, uh, you might want to use the chapters below to uh, navigate to the practical part where you can hear the different models. But uh, if you want to learn something, watch the entire video. So basically, we're using the eye boxes to connect all kinds of signals to a microphone preamplifier, to the mic input of an outboard mic pre or of your interface or of a mixing console. And most of the time, those are weaker signals, unbalanced weaker signals coming from guitar or bass pickups. And a DI box is basically doing three things. First of all, it's converting our unbalanced guitar signal into a balanced signal. That's one thing. I'm going to explain that in a minute. It's going to take care of the levels. So the microphone preamp is happy. And most importantly, it's going to take care of the impedance because we're connecting a high impedance guitar output to a microphone input that is expecting a much lower impedance. And I'm gonna explain those three things, but I wanna focus on the impedance part because I feel like that is, first of all, the most difficult one to understand and also the most important one. But let's start with unbalanced versus balanced signals. So an unbalanced signal is a two wire signal that consists of yeah the, the signal itself and a ground. And if we have a balanced signal, you can see it here, three pins or three wires. The main difference is that it carries the signal twice, which makes it louder, but it's actually very smart because at the beginning of the cable, one of those two signals gets polarity of phase inverted. And then at the end of the cable, it gets back to normal. That means any interference, any hum, any noise that the cable might pick up along the way will be fully canceled out. So that means balanced signals will pick up way less noise, hum, interferences compared to unbalanced signals. And this is important if you have longer cable runs. If you're in your home studio and you connect your guitar straight to your interface, that's not important. You don't need balanced, um, a balanced signal here. But let's say you are sending the signal from one room to another. Guitarist in one room, in the live room, you are in the control room, you want to record the DI, or from the stage to the front of house, situations like that. So as soon as you have longer cable runs, you want them to be balanced. And this is where standalone dedicated DI boxes have an advantage compared to your interface with an instrument input. Because, you know, you cannot separate that from, from, from the interface and the interface will be close to your computer and you can't run a guitar cable, whatever, 30 meters into your live room. That's not going to work. So in those cases, if you have longer cable runs, you really want to invest into a standalone DI box. If you're just recording guitars and basses in your control room, you don't need that. You can use the instrument input on your interface, which, by the way, is a DI box and a mic pre in one box. So if you're using a high Z input on your interface, it's basically the same thing. So turning an unbalanced signal into a balanced signal will not actually change your guitar tone, but it will help you to get a cleaner signal because all the noise that you might pick up will also be amplified later when we reamp the guitars no matter if it's a real amp or an amp sim. If you're sending that noise into a high gain amp, it will be amplified. So 
it helps us to get a cleaner signal. Let's talk about the levels. So, as I've said, from the DI box, we're going into a microphone preamp. And that means we want to make the mic pre happy and the mic pre is expecting some kind of microphone level. And this here, a DI box, is not really an amplifier. This is just preparing our guitar signal to go into an amplifier, which is the mic pre, where we set the levels, where we bring the level from microphone level to line level and into our converters. Most DI boxes just have a pad. So all you do is you pad down the signal if it is too hot for your mic pre. And this happens very often with active DI boxes and active pickups. So this is not an active amplifier that's gonna amplify your signal. No, most of the time it's actually the opposite. And then the microphone preamp will take care of amplifying the signal. Okay, but now let's talk about impedance. This is maybe the most difficult to understand part, but also the most interesting and maybe the most important part. And I'm gonna try to explain it in the most catchy and understandable and um, idiot-proof way, you know, from musician to musician. You know, I'm gonna try to make it as, as easy as possible. What you need to understand is this. Your guitar, your pickups have an output impedance, which by the way, is pretty high. That's why it always says like high Z, you know, on the inputs a high output impedance. And the microphone amplifier is expecting a way lower impedance, the impedance of a microphone. So we need something in between to convert that. So everybody's happy because, and here's the interesting part, the output impedance of your pickups and the input impedance of any device you connect it to, doesn't matter what it is, they will have a reaction. They will actually interact. What you need to understand is that your pickups will sound different depending on the input impedance of the following device. So that means if you connect your guitar to whatever, device A, it will sound different compared to device B because your pickups will be loaded differently and will sound differently. And here it gets important, right? Because what we want to achieve when we record a DI track that we're going to reamp later we want the pickup to believe it is connected to a guitar amp, okay? And with the wrong impedance, the pickup's gonna behave differently and it's gonna sound differently. And I've been using a simple analogy with a car and a street, but I just found something even better to explain impedance to you. There's a link below, and this analogy comes from my dear friends at Audient. There's a link below if you want to read this. I'm going to explain this, but maybe you want to read this one more time. And they are not talking about a road and a car. They're talking about a train and a bridge. But let's combine this. Let's take my car and their bridge. So here's how it works. Imagine a bridge over a valley in between two mountains, okay? And then we've got your car and you want to pass that bridge. And the car stands for your guitar signal. And the higher the impedance, output impedance of your pickup, the heavier the car and the more demanding for the bridge. The bridge, on the other hand, is the input impedance of the following device. Let's say the DI box or the guitar amp or whatever, the mic pre, whatever it is. And the higher the input impedance, the more stable, the heavier, that bridge will be. And the lower the input impedance, the more shaky and unstable it gets. That means if we lower the impedance, the input impedance of the following device, once you, you enter that bridge, it gets really shaky, especially if you have a heavy car, high output impedance. And if it gets shaky, you can't drive that fast. But if you have like a stable bridge, you can go much faster. And the tempo here is actually our signal, the level of our signal. So the higher the input impedance of the following device, the more stable the bridge, the faster we can drive. That means we have a stronger signal. And the weaker it gets, the weaker our signal gets. The level actually drops. But there's even more. There's even more. So let's just imagine that shaky bridge. If it gets really shaky, what's gonna happen is the loose parts on your car, they might fall off. Some screws, whatever, you know. 
And the looser parts in this example are the high frequencies, especially, and the transients, because that's, that makes it more complicated. Uh, impedance is not linear. It's very frequency dependent, but let's skip that for now. Oh, it is actually very inter interesting also with guitar power amps and the impedance curve of the cabinet that you connect that really determines how a tube amp sounds. And it actually makes a tube amp behave like a tube amp and sound like a tube amp, but that's a different story. So back to our bridge. So what I'm saying is the lower the input impedance of the follow-up device, the weaker your signal and the darker your signals. It will roll off the highs. It will get darker and darker. The transient response will be slower. Is that necessarily something bad? Not really. But if you want to have a signal that is as true as possible to the actual sound of your pickups, it means we want to have a very, very stable bridge. That means we want to have the highest input impedance possible. And it doesn't really matter if you connect a guitar to a DI box or if you connect a microphone to a mic input. What you want is a certain, let's say, relation between the impedance. So, for example, with microphones, if we take a typical dynamic microphone with a impedance of 200 ohm, and they say the input impedance of the mic pre should be five to ten times higher in order to make the microphone perform well. So that means if the microphone has 200 ohms output impedance, we want to have at least one kilo ohm or better two kilo ohm input impedance on the preamp. At least if we want to have a strong signal, the most natural transients and full highs. Of course, this can be used creatively. There are some audience preamps, for example, where you can switch the impedance to something much lower and that will color the sound of certain microphones especially dynamic mics and ribbon mics. And it's the same with passive pickups. So if you lower the impedance, things will get darker and sound different. This, again, this can be used creatively, but again, what we are doing here is we're trying to get the cleanest signal possible into our DAW. So that means, once again, make sure the impedance is high. And that's why the input impedance of all those DI boxes is very high, sometimes even mega ohm, because that is the input impedance of a typical guitar amp. And that is what a pickup is used to, especially, by the way, passive pickups. They react to this like a lot more sensitive. Then the output impedance is much lower, something like two or 300 ohms, typical microphone impedance. Why? Because we're connecting it to a mic pre and that makes the mic pre happy. And here comes our first audio example. And this proves how important it is to use an instrument preamplifier, to use a high Z input, to use a DI box, and not to plug your guitar into a, the line input of your whatever interface or console. So what you're gonna hear now is the difference between plugging the guitar into an instrument in and a line in. Have a listen. Wow, what a big difference, right? It gets so much darker. And this was exactly what I was describing. So the line input is a very, very shaky bridge. So we lose a lot of highs and you really don't want that. It's so extreme. You can also hear this through an amp. <laughs> So this is the influence that a, a mismatch of impedance can have to your signal. You really don't want that. So first thing we've learned is never plug your guitar into a line input because the line input, the impedance of the line input is way too low. But you know what? It's going to get more complex even. I'm sorry, because we're going to connect any DI box to a mic pre. And here the impedance needs to be matched one more time. Let me just look at the numbers. So this one, this Telefunken Active DI has an input impedance here of 30 kilo ohm and an output impedance of 250 ohm, like a dynamic microphone, 250 ohm. 
So in order to get a clean signal, now we need a mic pre that has an input impedance that is high enough again. And you know what? I When I started doing this video, I made a mistake. I was actually using my warm audio 412 something preamp that I really like. It's a great sounding preamp. It's their take on an API preamp. I use it a lot, but I think it only has an input impedance of 600 ohm or something. So I was using that and I could hear the differences between the DI boxes, but only when I plugged in the DI boxes into some preamps with a high input impedance, modern sounding preamps, the differences got so much more obvious. And here are two examples. So right now in this video, we're using this Cranborn Camden preamp, which I think has an input impedance, I forgot, but something like 3K or high enough. Another very good example, because this one isn't exactly cheap, are pretty much all the Audient preamps. I can really recommend them here because they all have, some of them are switchable, but they all have a really high impedance. Any of the Audient preamps, the Evo preamps and the ID preamps, or this uh, Cranborn Camden preamp as well. And there are others as well, but always check the input impedance. You don't want to use any vintage sounding preamps here with an uh, input impedance at a few hundred ohms or something, okay? The differences are quite big. But of course, it's not only the, the impedance. Each of those DI boxes has one or several transformers and they also color the sound. Then we have passive and active DI boxes. We'll talk about that. So it's not only the impedance. And we will see that numbers are not everything when we test those different DI boxes. Now let's quickly talk about active versus passive, both pickups and DI boxes. We got a passive DI box from Atelier der Tonkunst here and two active ones, one from Telefunken and one called Dark Storm from Lightning Boy Audio. The advantage of a passive DI box is that it doesn't need any power. That's cool. You can also use it for reamping, so you can use it like in, in both directions. And um, so it's, it's easy to use more or less, but it's known to color the sound a little more, especially if you have passive pickups. This one sounds great though, I gotta say that. Great sounding DI box, passive one. And active DI boxes usually also have a higher level. Something like, I don't know, 15, 20 dB higher usually. So depending on your source, you gotta choose the right one. And what people say is actually right, that if you play passive pickups, you better go for an active DI usually because it's gonna color your sound less. A passive DI is gonna darken it slightly and it might also take away some of the low end. So an active DI is gonna perform better with your passive pickups. Or let's say the other way, your passive pickups gonna perform better with an active DI. And usually passive pickups need more level, so this works. Active pickups like my EMGs, they don't really care. They work great with a passive DI and passive DIs are usually also cheaper, you know, and um, if I use my EMGs with this one, I need to use a pad all the time. But in the end, yeah, it depends on the pickups you play, but it also depends on the sound that you want. And finally, here comes the practical part. Today, we, I want to compare three different models and I chose those three high quality, high end models, because I think they give you a pretty good overview of what, how the eye boxes can sound and what they can do. So like I already introduced, we got this passive model from Atelier der Tonkunst, their high res DI, which is very, very popular over here in Germany. Passive DI sounds great. Like they do, they make their own transformers and uh, many people love them passive design and I've been using it for years, especially with my active pickups, with my EMG pickups. Then we have this one here. This is the active um, DI box from Telefunken USA. I'm not going to say Telefunken and you shouldn't say Telefunken either. So it's Telefunken, Telefunken uh, USA and this is a great sounding DI box too. So the first time I tested it, I was like, wow, this sounds so full and complete or something. It's really, really big and warm and nice sounding. I liked it. And um, it's using, I think, a transformer, a British transformer from Conhill. And they're also doing the transformers for Neve, for the classic Neve designs. Great sounding, active design. And then we've got something 
special down here. This is a company from New York called Lightning Boy Audio, and this is actually a mic pre, but in combination with a JFED instrument pre-amplifier. I think I'm gonna do a dedicated video about this because this is such an interesting device, especially the mic pre has some cool features, some, some, some cool features to color your sound. It even has a guitar out, so you can go with your instrument into the preamp and then go into your amp or stomp boxes or with the mic and then into your amp. It's, it's cool. But the funny part is that this one can go from very clean, that's what they say, to colored or even highly distorted, which is of course more fun. Okay, time to test those three boxes. Here we go. All right, so here we are in Cubase and I've already recorded the same twangy chord, like a little percussive chicka 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 kind of thing through all those different boxes. Actually through those three you see here and also through the instrument input of the Cranbourne Camden preamp. And I gotta say the results are quite interesting. All the DIs were going through the Camden mic input except for the Dark Storm, which has an inbuilt preamp. So that was going into the line input. And these are all different takes. That's why I only recorded one chord to make them sound as similar as possible and to really hear the differences between the DI boxes. When I started this, the first thing I tried to do is was to use the through output that every DI box usually has, but it quickly turned out if you use that, it changes the tone. It changes the level, that's one thing, well, that's not a problem, but it changes the tone depending on the input impedance of wherever you go. So I decided to just connect each DI box separately and record a single take, a separate take for each DI box. All right. They're all level matched and I wanna start with this one, with the active Telefunken DI box because this one has impressed me quite a bit. Let's have a listen. And this is not only really full sounding, it also has this high end shimmer. It almost sounds like a piezo pickup. Have a listen. It sounds really, really full range, really nice. And you will hear the difference if I switch to any of the other ones. So let's just go to the Atelier der Tonkunst to the ADT. I start with the Telefunken again. And what a difference. That sounds like switching your pickup, right? It gets a lot darker. Remember, this is a passive DI. It gets a lot darker so that that high-end shimmer is suddenly gone. Also, like the Telefunken seems to be a little faster. I don't know. On the other hand, the ADT has some kind of twangy upper mid bite. Let's start with the Telefunken again. Overall, I don't know, the ADT sounds more like an electric guitar and through the Telefunken it sounds more like a, an acoustic guitar re recorded through a piezo. Not really, but you, you know what I mean. So it sounds a little fuller, a little more extended in the frequency range. Let's move on with the input of the Cranbourne. So I'm gonna start with the Telefunken again. And that was a little disappointing because it also gets darker and it also gets a little thinner. It just seems like a little more telephonish compared to the Telefunken. Let's switch back and forth between the three. So the Cranborn has the same twangy upper mid-range like the ADT. So maybe 
that is just how the pickups actually sound and the Telefunken is hiding something there. I don't know, making things a little warmer in the upper mid-range. So the Cranborn and the ADT have the same twang, but the ADT just sounds fresher and faster than the Cranborn, if that's the right description. The Cranborn is the darkest of the bunch. Let's move on with the Dark Storm, and let me just say a few words about it. So this is a mic pre, like I said, but also an instrument amplifier. And what they say is you can go from really clean to really dirty. So the first setting I was using was this one. So input all the way down, output all the way up. I think the input impedance is at one mega ohm, so really high. And what they promise is a super clean sound with a lot of high end. Let's just start with the Telefunken as our reference and let's go to the clean setting of the Dark Storm. And what a difference. And that sounds so in your face, even more twangy. It also sounds louder. Slightly aggressive. Just like a, a little more open version of the ADT. And it just feels a lot louder. So this one is the most direct, the most in your face sounding of the whole bunch. And the Telefunken seems to sound the most special. It has some very extended highs, but right below that, all those twangy mids that the other DI boxes have are kind of rounded off. So it sounds a little warmer in the upper mid range, just a little nicer. And now it depends on what you want. Very, very interesting. I've got one more setting. So this is the dark storm in the clean. And then we have a dirty setting where I was already pushing things a little bit. We can hear some distortion already and you know you can see that it gets a lot darker it gets fatter it gets fuller interesting so yeah you got tonal options the more you boost it it seems the darker and fuller it gets next thing i want to do is i want to turn on a guitar amp or a full guitar rig and what i'm going to use here is a great plugin for my friends at bogren digital it's their amp knob rev c and bogren's take on a on a rectifier and i use that plugin a lot like for all my quick and dirty stuff and playing it's just just sounds great and we're going to use it here as well the gain is all the way down so we don't need high gain here we want to hear uh, especially the transients as good as possible. So let's start with Telefunken. And that's the Dark Storm, clean setting. Wow. So this almost sounds like adding a tube screamer. Like I said, in your face. And the Telefunken is a lot more reserved, a lot warmer. Now, which is, what's what's interesting is that the extended highs of the Telefunken are... I can't hear them anymore. I think they're just like rolled off by the speaker, the guitar speaker anyway. But what I can hear is like the twanginess. So now the Dark Storm sounds actually brighter than the Telefunken. And let's compare the Telefunken to the ADT. Same thing, just more gentle. So the ADT seems to be in between the Telefunken and the Dark Storm. So I get more and more the impression that the Telefunken really has a special sound, which is warmer in the upper mid range, just a little more gentle. And the ADT is somewhere in between. And the Dark Storm is the most aggressive of the bunch. It's a little bit like adding a Tube Screamer. So now I would say it depends on what you want, right? It really depends on what you want. If you want something to cut through and maybe to be a little nasty and aggressive in your face, use the Dark Storm. If you want the opposite, you should go for the Telefunken. 
Let's continue with bass guitar. I've played the same riff three times through the ADT, the Telefunken and the Darkstorm in the clean setting using my Esch bass with a passive pickup. And let's find out which one of those DIs is the best one for a clanky metal bass. And let's see if the results go into the same direction with the Telefunken sounding rather round in the upper mid range, but having a nice low end and high end and the ADT and the Darkstorm being more aggressive and mid forward. Let's start with the Telefunken and let's have a listen. <laughs> And wow, what a difference. So the results are the same. The Telefunken just seems to be warmer in the upper mid range. The Darkstorm is quite a bit more aggressive, more clanky, which I prefer for metal bass tones. On the other hand, the low end of the Telefunken seems to be a little fuller. Let's have another listen. Maybe you want to focus on the low end. So far the ADT has been in between the two others. Let's have a listen. Yeah, sounds very fast, very clanky, very nice. Not as thick as the Telefunken. Yeah, the ADT and the Darkstorm sound pretty close to each other. And this supports my theory that the Telefunken is actually the most colored one of the bunch. Uh, it just makes things sound rounder, makes things sound warmer. And now it depends on what you want to record. If you want to record a clanky, modern sounding, aggressive metal bass tone, you should go for the Darkstorm or the ADT. If you want to record something that sounds warm and full and lush and round, you better go for the Telefunken. You always got to choose the right tools so they support the tone you want right from the beginning. But wow, what a difference, right? So what we learned today is that even something that seems to be boring like a DI box will have a pretty big impact on your tone and you should make the right decision. I'm not saying this one is better than the others. They all sound kind of cool, but the more you know your gear, I call this call this my tone matrix. So the, no, the more you know, okay, this is gonna sound more aggressive. This is gonna sound a little warmer the easier it is to choose uh, the right gear in the right moments, especially if you're working with bands and don't have a lot of time. So uh, this was eye-opening and ear-opening. Cool. All right, I'll put links to all the, 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 all the gear we used in this video, all the DI boxes below. But now it's time to have some dirty little fun with this box here, the Dark Storm. It's called Dark Storm, you know, so it's supposed to sound evil, right? So I will grab my guitar now and I will show you what you can do with this. Uh, it's pretty inspiring because it can actually go from really clean to something pretty fucked up. Let's go. All right, time to have some fun. I'm playing this lovely guitar. I hope you can see it. Uh, one of my favorite guitars, my good old Gibson, the Paul. Look how thin it is. Uh, with passive pickups. I think they are the standard 498 or something from, from Gibson. Nothing special. Great sounding guitar. And we're going straight into the Rev C plugin from Bogren Digital through the Darkstorm. And you see we are in the clean setting. <laughs> Time to have some fun and to play around with the settings here. So what you can do basically is you can just add more gain. 
Then we have a low cut, which is actually really helpful to tighten the lows before you hit the amps. And then we got this old switch that is actually gonna bring down the impedance like on more vintage mic pre's. So it's probably gonna sound darker and add more color. So let's play around with the gain knob and the output fader. Uh, this one actually goes back to zero. Really nice. And we can use that to compensate the added gain here because we don't wanna clip our converters, right? Listen to the palm mutes. It changes the whole texture because we're adding a lot of distortion already. Let me make this a little more gentle. It's just giving us like a touch of fuzz and it's making that modern high gain tone a little more interesting. Compared to this. Which is nice and tight, but not as cool as. Well, let's go crazy. By the way, there's, a, there's this low cut switch, which is really helpful if you add a lot of distortion because it tightens up the palm mute. So we can add even more gain. Reminds me of typo negative. And this gives you endless sustain. We can even, we don't even need the full distortion of the amp anymore. which is fantastic for like drone-like riffs or just doom riffs and stuff like that. And then you can just go back. Any tight metal playing. But let's go totally crazy. Let's leave the, the low cut on, but let's also engage the old switch. This is so much more fun. <laughs> it's cool. Okay, you get you, you get the point, right? So what you can do is you can add a lot of attitude with this. But as we've seen, you can also get a very clean sound. Let's just have a listen with the amp bypass so you see how much distortion we're actually adding. Don't want to clip the converters. Almost looks like an amp track. Let's record this. <laughs> Look at this. Nice. Anyway, um, you might say, yeah, but can I do the same thing with the other uh, DIs or with my 
normal the eye track by just adding more gain and I gotta say no, I tried that. It works to a certain extent, but this special fuzzy clipping of the DI is something that a guitar amp can give you. And the other thing is that you can usually have the gain a lot lower on the guitar amp, which will make the whole thing less noisy. I think I'm gonna do a dedicated video um, because mainly this is a mic pre. Really cool. But let's just sum it up. DI boxes, instrument inputs matter. That's what we've learned today, right? And we've tested some great sounding gear. And I gotta say, this one is rather special, rather special. Extended highs, extended lows, kind of smooth in a way. So uh, if that's what you're looking for. Check out the Telefunken DI box. Atelier der Tonkunst, a passive classic, so to say. Also sounds really nice. And this one, you've heard it. It can do a lot. Overall, I feel like it has a really aggressive DI tone to it, which is cool. You choose whatever you need. All right, what I want you to do is subscribe to this channel, first of all, ring the ding-dong bell, and leave a comment, because I might do more DI videos. Which DIs should I test? Is that something you want to see? I don't know. Let me know. Which DI box are you using, and have you ever compared it to something else? Because most people don't. They just buy something, and it works, and that's what it is. So those comparisons actually really help. And to, please let me know which one is your favorite. Uh, support all those three companies. They're really cool. Like Lightning Boy Audio and Atelier Tonkunst are really small boutique companies. Telefunken is a great company. Hello Telefunken, please send me all your microphones. I want to test them. They look so sexy. I've never tested a Telefunken mic so far. I would love to do that. All right, that's all for today. Thanks for watching. Uh, I hope I could enlighten you a little bit. I see you in hell, motherfuckers. Bye-bye. <laughs>